And it, it is a wild thing to me. It is a wild thing to me that you guys drag these deer out whole. <laughs> that I was is explaining a, this to him. Bonkers. Yeah. Yeah. That is ab- oh. So we have, I don't know if you guys have them. Um, we call them knives. And it's, <laughs> it's sharp <laughs> on one side. And you can take something heavy like the biggest deer in the world, and you can cut them down, make them smaller, make it easier. Why do you do that? That is crazy. You can joke all you want. You need to talk to the Fish and Game Commission. You're barking up the wrong trees. We don't have any say in how we have to handle our deer. But yeah. Actually, we can cut them up here. You can cut yeah, them up you here. Can, you can pack them out. But then you can't weigh them. Then That's you can't weigh thing. them, see? Because oh, in see. Maine, they got the biggest bucks in Maine club if you if you kill one that uh, field dresses over 200. Not 199 and a half. That's right. It's got to be 200. We're not rounding up. These are stories of outdoor adventure and expert advice from folks with calloused hands. I'm James Nash, and this is the Six Ranch Podcast. The Six Ranch Podcast is brought to you by Sig Sauer. Sig is a leading provider and manufacturer of firearms, electro optics, ammunition, air guns, and suppressors. For over 250 years, Sig Sauer Inc. has evolved and thrived by blending American ingenuity, German engineering, and Swiss precision. Today, Sig Sauer is synonymous with industry leading quality and innovation which has made it the brand of choice amongst the U.S. military, the global defense community, law enforcement, competitive shooters, hunters, and responsible citizens. Sig Sauer is also a premier provider of elite firearms instruction and tactical training at the Sig Sauer Academy located in New Hampshire. For more information about Sig Sauer and its complete line of products, visit SigSauer.com. Welcome to the Big Woods Bucks podcast. I'm your host, Hal Blood, and uh, down here at Pylon Lodge again with my co-host, Joe Cruzy. Hello. And we're doing something a little different tonight. We're going to, uh, it's the end of muzzleloader season. Are we shooting deer, Hal? <laughs> That's different. Yeah. If you'd shoot uh, one, it'd be different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. We're kind of doing a dual podcast. Uh we got some guests here from uh, Sig Sauer, and and uh, their one of their ambassadors is from Oregon, right? Yes, sir. And it's um, Six Ranch. Six Ranch, not Sex Ranch. Yeah, Six S- Ranch. Six Ranch. Six Ranch. <laughs> the Sex Ranch is entirely different. Yeah, it's the Six Ranch podcast. So we're going to uh, kind of record this together, and it'll go out on both podcasts. Honored to be here. Thank you for uh, for letting us do this. Yeah, and uh, you got a co-host too, huh? Yeah. So I'm I'm James Nash with the Six Ranch Podcast and uh, Six Ranch Outfitters, and then we also have Mr. Patrick Hanley, who you guys have heard from a lot recently from uh, Sig Sauer as the rifle and ammunition product line manager. Yep, I've been at Six Sauer now for four years, and uh, I. Formerly came from, uh, I've been in the gun industry now for 10 years, and uh, it's uh, close to home here to be sitting here with Mr. Nash, who I've been going out west with and bringing him here into a little bit of walk in our life so he can see what it's like hunting in the east. He's got a little culture shock, don't he? He sure does. I don't think he's ever <laughs> seen anything like this in his life. I think we're giving him a, 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 something that uh, something he'll take home and remember from here. Yeah few more trees on these hillsides here and there you do have a few more stems per acre they're <laughs> not you're not quite as big uh, a little bit closer together um you can't really tell if you're walking on ground or water most of the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but it's it's even more fun when you get about six inches of wet snow on them hillsides there trying to get up over them I bet. What do you guys do for traction in that? Do you wear micro spikes on your boots or do just rubber boot and slide around and cuss at things? What's a micro spike? I don't know. We just use rubber boots. Okay. They can get get slippery. You've probably realized why we wear rubber boots, right? (laughs) Yes, sir. It's pretty wet. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. 
lot of water. You can you can be walking up on a mountain somewhere and go right up to your knees in a like a it, this really spring seeps or something, but muck holes right up to your knees, right in the middle of a hardwood ridge or something. So it's I, just I different. get the sense that occasionally in the summertime you will see a mosquito or two. Yeah, we get a few of them around, but they're not too bad. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> not during the daytime anyway. No. <laughs> Actually, I live down. When I lived down on the coast, on the ocean, they were worse down there. I, you know, it's a lot of, you know, there's a water from the ocean, and then there's a lot of backwaters that wash up, and you, you couldn't go outside the house at, in the evening down there. But up here we can. If you live in the higher ground, like I live up on a ridge, and mosquitoes aren't bad up there. It's down around the water. They're pretty bad sometimes. But So been, how's, how's the hunt been this week? Uh, sparse. Uh, <laughs> I think we uh, – we, <laughs> We got in here the first day and we were pretty optimistic when we saw the snow had hit the ground and we got out yesterday and uh, we had made our way around and saw a decent amount of tracks. I, I did. Uh, I think me and uh, the people I were with, we saw a good amount of tracks, but I know you guys were driving around quite a bit trying to find anything whatsoever. But literally, we found a uh, we found like a track that we were able to cut in and I think it was in an area where you guys were just talking about and we started working our way in and we ended up finding a decent buck that we followed for probably about a mile and a half and then by the afternoon yesterday it was just back to dry ground yeah. and we lost it and couldn't get any further yeah this has been one of the most difficult muzzleloader seasons I've seen in quite a while I I've been trying to figure it out because it's it's really a big lack of deer movement. It's like it's like the end of last week, the light switch got flipped off. I mean, everybody was tracking snow. You know, when we had tracking snow some last week, it, you know, everybody was on tracks. But then all of a sudden, I mean, we, me and Jerry have covered some ground this week and haven't seen much for tracks. You know, we tracked one big one Monday. There was some snow up high. And we never even it, it dropped down low and got out of the snow, but that was a real good one. And and uh, other than that, we haven't found another like real big track. You know, we've seen some buck tracks, but nothing, nothing huge. And and all that travel and not even a lot of doe tracks. I think they're not even. You seem to be when you when you hit a doe track, even it's it ain't going anywhere. It's in a little thicket or a little knob. Or, you know, they're not traveling around much. And I kind of want to bring this into perspective for the the western audience you know that's more used to my podcast because i know people are listening to this going why are they just talking about tracks instead of talking about deer well because you can't see anything (laughs) anywhere so unless it's at like bad breath range you're just simply not gonna see an animal here so the move you guys are hunt hunting deer the way we hunt lions or bears or something like that you're you're traveling roads you're trying to cut a track once you see the track and it's something that you're interested in you're setting out on it the same way we would set out with dogs or on foot if you're in a state that can't use dogs and then trying to basically become a history student until you run into current events and uh <laughs> And then hopefully, you know, you were able to look at that track and know when that animal was going to slow down enough that you'd be intercepting it and be able to break a shot. I like how you broke that down from history to current events. Yeah. That's about what it's like. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's because you might find a track and that buck is five miles from there. So you you think you're hunting around where there's a buck, but he ain't nowhere around there. So... And and for most of the country, if a whitetail is going to travel five miles, it means that four and a half of those miles were in the back of an F-150 going to the taxidermist, right? Yeah. So in in these high high ag areas, these deer are not traveling very far at all. Some of them can and, and often do during the rut, but then they're day-to-day, they're still not traveling all that far. Your habitat just doesn't have enough food. Like these deer have really got to move. Well, I don't think it's a food. It's not the food so much because there is feed almost everywhere. Wherever you find deer, there's just feed there, and they don't they don't go to and from it. But them bucks travel because there's not as many does, so they have to travel to breed. You know, in the farm country, there might be a hundred does and a hundred acres, and that you know there might be one here. You know. So, what's your buck to doe ratio like? 
Well, I think it's pretty even. It is. Yeah. And what do you attribute that to? Because that there's nowhere else in the country that's like that. Lack of predation, maybe. No, we they've this coyotes. You know, the predators are the coyotes, and they get more. They'll kill more does and fawns than bucks. So I think it balances it out. So if, I mean, in this whole area here, I mean, around Jacklin, there's one one tagging station. You know, where you register your, your deer, and it probably covers an area of 20 mile radius around it from the deer from 20 miles around. I don't know how many square miles it is, but it's a lot, you know. And on a, most of the years lately, they've been tagging about a little over 100 every year. This year it's down. When I looked at it last Saturday, it was like it was only like 75. So hunters aren't really any impact on the deer herd, right, in, a, in an area that size, 100 box isn't very much so it looks to me like they got them all sir yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it may appear that I way second that. <laughs> <laughs> it may appear that way but i guarantee you it ain't yeah i'm kidding I'm yeah kidding. so anyways and i just think it the mortality on the it's it's mainly the winners anyways because the hunting doesn't control the deer herd here if we have one bad winner we can lose half the deer herd and then it got to build back up again so i think that's what keeps it balanced i think overall statewide they're they're trying to affect the deer herd they're giving out more and more doe tags and and trying to knock the numbers down and it's not working (laughs) no not in southern maine but they don't they don't have the bad winners to contend with you know no i know but i mean they're 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 trying to use which obviously it works to some extent but they keep on increasing opportunity And, uh, you know, the numbers are still staying strong. So this would be a really difficult population to survey and try and figure out exactly how many deer you have and what you're dealing with. I agree. They, they, uh, they don't really know. I mean, they, they try to, you know, extrapolate things and they claim there's about on average in the North Main woods, four deer per square mile. That ain't a lot. I'm 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 going to throw a flag on that field. <laughs> <laughs> you agree with that, huh? <laughs> no, sir. No, I, I I think it might be less than that. Well, it is in some areas. Yeah. So there might be some square I visited, miles with. Z- I visited a lot of those. <laughs> yeah. There's going to be some with zero, but yeah. there's going to be some around here with ten. Sure. Yeah. That's just what it is. It doesn't average out, and it's there's always more deer closer to where ever they spend the winter you know they spread out from that nucleus so anywhere is within a radius of a deer yard that they get to in the winter there's always more deer now my folks are not going to know what a deer yard is that sounds like a really cool thing like a, maybe they're picturing like the little ornament things that people put out <laughs> next to their <laughs> flamingos so what is what is a, a a deer yard. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you put the inflection on it like that. Thank you. I've been <laughs> practicing. It's technically the biologists call it a deer wintering area. Okay. So it's like your elk. They go to a wintering area, right? Sure. Mule deer, anything. Yeah. Right. Same thing here. Yeah. They they migrate to a, a wintering area that has a canopy of spruce fir and cedar that holds the snow up and. Gives them shelter and there's feed in it, you know. They go there and spend the winter and, you know, the coyotes follow them there and pick them off. But I've they, been seeing some big coyote tracks. You have? Yeah. We're going to take care of them pretty quick here, getting the hounds fired Promises, up. promises. Yep. <laughs> what kind of hounds? Use, they mostly use in running walkers. Yep. For, for running coyotes? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, running is in the deep snow, you know, when you get that deep powder because the coyotes got to jump and the hounds are behind and they coyotes making a trail for them yeah they catch them pretty quick in the deep snow interesting that's another yeah. thing that you, you're not seeing very much there's some folks out west that use catch dogs um, yeah they use them greyhounds i've seen a videos of that they use greyhounds they use a lot of uh a lot of terrier mixed dogs too though um yeah so they'll they'll bring out some curs while they're calling and curs will dog a coyote in and then they'll send out that terrier and the terrier will kill it. 
Yeah. These are bigger terriers, you know, Idaho shaggies and things like that. They're 35, 40 pounds. Is that, is that the videos I'm seeing where they're running with the trucks across the big open fields and then they just, that's they open the, the, that's the greyhounds. I think that's the ones I've seen is they let the greyhounds out and the greyhounds run them right down in the fields. But here it's, it's again, it's different because you've seen the woods, right? So it's the same for the coyotes, you know, the dogs have to run them. They don't see them until they, coyote plays out enough where they catch up or quite often or most of the time actually we're shooting them the coyote like crossing a trail or a right a road or some pack something packed like that from a person who's hunted out west for coyotes with james and spent my whole life out here it is completely different and quite frankly they are without dogs out here they are incredibly hard which is why i think the the coyotes out here, are, they're pretty much killed by chance. A lot of the ones that I see, at least, they're people who are out deer hunting. They see a coyote walk by and they take a shot at it. I, I don't think that they're as, as uh, intentionally hunted as they are in the West. And just the reason being, it's the woods are so big out here. Like, having gone out and seeing what you guys do, the country's so big, you can you can make a 500-yard shot at a coyote and, and oh, fit yeah, that herd out pretty quick. Yeah. yeah. And, ain't and gonna out, get any closer <laughs> and out here a lot of times in the snow you go out and you put out a predator call and you come back to leave and you see those prints right behind you where he walked out and circled behind you to check to see what the scent was before you had a chance to even see him so it's it's a very different world for predators out here they have a very very easy way of maneuvering around without anybody knowing they're there there's a lot of wildlife here so i've seen i've seen bobcat tracks i've seen fisher tracks we saw an ermine today um, lynx, you must have seen some lynx tracks. I didn't see any lynx no. tracks. No, yeah. that, that would that would have been cool. A lot yeah. of lynx around. Are I, there? I saw one right on the Spencer Road the first week crossing the road. The, the other thing, too, is that the deer yards are not traditional like they used to be. They used to be in natural cover, and those have been pretty much cut over throughout the state, the big deer yards. So now the towns have turned into deer yards where everyone's feeding them in town, so the deer have now it's generational. They're learning to go to the town. So the town of the, you know, West Forks and the town of Jackman is where all the deer go and congregate. And that's where the coyotes go. So that's where the bulk of the coyote hunting and where they're killed in the winter. Um, usually what, 40 or 50 you guys will get in a. Sometimes. Yeah. But we've done enough now. I, I, we were talking about this one other time, but you know, I read a lot about the coyotes over the years when they first started here, and they would always, biologists would claim you can't control the population because they'll have more young ones, and it's not true. We've controlled them here to the point that the deer have really don't even struggle hardly anymore, even though you see some tracks in the woods. I mean, there's coyotes. You're not going to get rid of them. But when we first, the first year we started hunting, we started right in, going right into the deer yards, you know, and getting tracks and getting on them and uh we started that first year though really late i think we got 17 and then the next year we we started right after deer season when the snow got got good and i think we killed 49 that next year and then i think 37 and last year i think 35 and what happens is when you take them out of the an area more filter in you know because they're territorial and then we get those. As those come in, we get those. So we, we've got them that have come from probably 15 to 20 miles away now. We're, we're cleaning those up. So that when you go out in the peripherals of town now, you don't hardly see any coyote tracks. I mean, I've been, you know, we've had a fair amount of snow all season, enough to see tracks. And the lack of coyote tracks is pretty impressive, really. It's good, you know. And you take a walk on my property that down in Skowhegan and it, it's littered. I mean, they're yeah. just. Yeah. They're, in Southern yeah. New Hampshire. And it, it's, it's crazy. The amount of coyotes we have around. And like I said, they just, they get trapped some, they get hunted some, but they definitely don't, they're, they're not hunted and trapped hardly enough. And not to mention the fact out here from, uh, you know, I was telling James this and it's interesting. Like what is your average coyote weight out there in Oregon? 28 32 pounds which we, we can get some big dogs out here some of these coyotes yeah. get pretty good some of these females out here especially get pretty good size it's a it's a it's a good deer killing animal which yeah when i go out west i'm always surprised that not as much out where you are but some of the parts of the west how small some of the the coyotes are compared to out here in the east 
Well, they are little, and a pup of the year won't make 20 pounds. You know, they're going to be in the teens, high teens. Mm -hmm. yeah. pe people look at them, and they look all fuzzy and stuff, and they're like, you know, they don't understand how small that target is. You're trying to hit a coffee cup. Yeah. Well, here we get them. Uh, the biggest ones are around 50. Yeah, that's and then plenty big coyote. Yeah, we get a lot of them around 40, you know, 35 to 40, a lot of them that size. Then the pups probably run 25, something like that. I bet as brushy as it is, you have a hard time getting a good pelt off of them. No, no, I think the hides are pretty good. I know the guys the guys that trap them here, and then the ones that we get, one of the guys takes them and skins them, and it's really the only fur now that's worth much money, you know, and they've been getting 100 bucks with some of them now. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah. Cats have been awesome. There no, a, they got a nice hide, most of them. There's a lot... Last year in North Dakota, that sold for two hundred twenty dollars. No kidding for coyote in the lot. Yeah, really, that's crazy. Yeah, that would turn up the coyote hunting probably if prices stayed up like that. Yeah, hunting and trapping. There's a bunch know. of people in Maine now doing it with the hounds, but there's a lot of people that also hunt over bait. You know, they put, you know, bait. You know, they use deer carcasses and deer. Yeah, you know anything beef you know go to the slaughterhouse and they put a pile out there and because the coyotes are hungry in the winter you know so they go to them bait piles and you can hunt all night here you know you can hunt with the light at night and everything so some of them guys where there's a lot of coyotes they they get quite a few that way but it's you got a lot in time invested for each one with, with the hounds i mean last year we had a day we we killed six in one day you know Nice. That's our record day. We've had a couple of five days, but six is the new record. Those are those big snowfall days. Oh, yeah. Deep snow and... Yeah, you get about 18 inches of powdery snow there. and Chases are pretty quick. <laughs> have you ever come out west and hunted lions or bobcats? No, never have. No. I think you need to do that. You need to come out and hunt lions. Yeah. Um it is so up your alley with, with this combination of what you're doing with coyotes and, you know, your lifetime of tracking deer. It is really, really interesting. And you'll see levels of houndsmanship that have exceeded, you know, anything I've experienced anywhere else in the world. So it, it's a neat thing. And I think that you would have a lot to contribute to those houndsmen in the, in the way that they're tracking lions because you've got to help those dogs out a lot. Oh, yeah. And uh, and then you'd probably learn something that you could bring back here and 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 maybe um, kill a deer, maybe. <laughs> is that uh, is that one of the things you guide for out there, the cat hunting? So I do, but um, Oregon you can't use dogs. Um, you can use dogs for bobcats because um, evidently a bobcat doesn't have a soul, but a mountain lion does. <laughs> <laughs> so we can we can we can run the spots off of a bobcat but we can't run um bears or lions anymore um did when i was a kid but uh it changed in like 1992 93 somewhere in there got put on the ballot and uh and our portland said no so um but uh yeah but no, our we, portland is turning into your portland though yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Not, believe it or not i've been to both they're not far apart yeah, yeah. Well, um, so we're, we're hunting our cats the same way you're hunting your deer, except that when you're following that track and you get to a spot where you think that lion may have stopped and made a kill or bedded up for the day, you're going to try and call him out of there and it'll take, you know, three or four hours probably. And if you're wrong and he walked out of that canyon and into the next one, then you're just wrong and you're out of luck. Oh yeah. So like predator calling. It's predator calling mixed in with, with what you're doing with, with the tracking. Oh, interesting. I don't know if I'd have the patience to sit around for four hours and call. <laughs> <laughs> Joe might. <laughs> I could. I sat for a long time yesterday. Uh, and then I got up and left and said, I'm not sitting anymore. <laughs> what you, I've seen for deer movement, I wouldn't sit five minutes. <laughs> well, I, it, was, it was down, uh, it was down oh, there yeah, in down our little below. spot down there uh, yeah. that Lee showed me last year. Some guys do just try to walk them down, and uh, and I know dudes who have who have straight up walked the line tracks down until the line got in a tree, and uh, they ran out of tracks and started looking up and found them and killed them. No guy that did it with a longbow, so it can it can be done. Um, 
with uh, with just the old left foot, right foot. That might yeah, be more, that might be your right more your style. <laughs> but you probably end up going a little bit farther than I would. <laughs> I'm right. hoping deer start climbing trees. Yeah, <laughs> sure would make life easier, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it is. I always like hearing about different hunting strategies from all over, and the only cat hunting I've seen. I know Rick Rick's done quite a bit of cat hunting. Um, I don't know what state he was doing I think it in. Idaho. Like, was he in Idaho? I yeah, he's had Idaho, good success yeah. out there. He's he's hunted all around doing that stuff out west, and and uh, he likes it. He he shot a couple big toms out there. Yeah. But I think it was more wherever he was was all hound hunting where they tree him and yeah, Idaho is, is dog country. Montana, um, Utah, Wyoming, it's all dog country. What's getting tough with the dogs anymore are wolves because we've had wolves show up and spread out so much. Wolves, um, if your hounds run into into wolves, your wolves will kill every dog you have, and you guys the guys just can't catch up in time. It happens really right. fast. That's a bad day. Mm. Can you imagine? Ooh, no. Can you imagine walking up on six of your dogs and all of them being dead? I, I certainly can't. And a lot of guys have had to live with that reality. And there's no compassion for it outside of the hunting community. Right. None at all. Mm-mm. Oh, no, they cheer for it. So yeah. now now guys are trying to, you know, do the ridiculous things like putting bells on their dogs. And, you know, of course, everybody's got a Garmin collar on their dog so that they can see if their dog stopped for some reason other than tree. And, uh, it, it's just a tough thing with these dogs in wolf country and, and wolves are freaking everywhere. And, you know, we were hunting Colorado last year and I found a wolf track, um, basically so far South that I could see New Mexico from where I was. And, uh, you know, me and me and Tim were together and I just stopped in the trail. I was so excited to hunt elk in a place that didn't have freaking wolves. And it's like, no, they followed me. <laughs> oh, kidding. And now they're putting wolves in Colorado intentionally. <laughs> right. I, I heard like that. You've, yeah. already, you've already got them, you crazy mm. people. But Yeah, we we don't even like to say the word around here because there's too many people that would love to see that. Sure. You know, they want to see them here and reintroduce them. And I think it's like our coyotes already have wolf DNA. That's part of the reason they're... They do. They've got 17%. Yep. They're I, a bigger species. It's one of the reasons they've got mixed in with wolves somewhere along the line but man do we lions and wolves we don't want them here no i mean the lions are fine they don't really it's not that big of a deal they they do kill a lot of deer but if you can hunt them with dogs you, you can keep the lions down it, it's it's not that big of a deal it's really not but uh but the wolves are are a very real problem and with with the population densities that you have here with your deer they They'd kill them all. They'd get them well, all. Well, the moose too. Oh yeah, that, that's my biggest concern. Is yeah. it would be the the deer and the moose. Yeah, I mean the folks in Idaho are thinking that their moose only have ten years left before they're all gone. Mm. Wow! So it's going to be a long cycle before the wolves eat themselves out of house and home, and then they start dropping off. I don't think they will because they've got livestock as a backup, right? So people kind of tend to think about. Western predators, like it's this terrarium model where you could create a balance beam. Like, oh, they eat too much. Now the wolf population has to go down to recover from it. It's not like that. They just go to the next menu item. And as long as people are growing livestock for food, then there's always going to be that resource available for those wolves to target. And, you know, we, we lose lots of cattle, lots of cattle. And it's extremely difficult. And we have folks that are like, well, why don't you just bring your cattle into the barn at night? It's like these things are <laughs> run, like, we're, we're moving cattle over a hundred mile an area throughout right. the year. We fly a super cub to find them in the fall. Right. Um, we can't just like hang out with them and make sure a wolf doesn't eat them. Like it's it's not that kind of situation. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. So uh, if uh, if it comes up in Maine. If, or for wherever the folks are listening, just uh, say no. Please. It's it's very similar to the stuff that Maine's faced with the in the last couple of years with the bear baiting. It's one of those things that it happens in other places of the country. It sets a precedent, and then they try to come out and they try to say everybody should do it. And that's where, like they were saying with the wolf thing, I think eventually it will try to make its way out here, just like the banning of bear baiting. It, it's a, a, something that I think these guys see and they say, oh, we were successful there. Now we can just run down and pick all the states and try to pick them all off at once. It's yeah. going to happen eventually, unfortunately. You know, it, 
what's happened in Maine is is we're getting a huge influx of people coming from the outside that want to move to Maine because they love it here, but then they want to change it to where <laughs> the same way it was where they came from. And, and so it, it's, everything's drawn right down the middle. It's 50, it's, it's always right around 50%. You know, it's a couple points above or below is how all this stuff always by a point or two, yeah. you know, is the way it goes. And unfortunately I think it's a matter of time before they chisel it away and wear everyone down and, and uh, get their way. Yeah. But the ace in the hole here is, is, when they're talking about wolves, they're talking about putting gray wolves here like everywhere else, and they're not native here. Yeah. They're trying to pretend like that's they were here and they weren't. We had a red wolf here historically, and it, not a gray wolf, but they don't they yeah. don't want to mention that. We yeah. had a timber wolf that was like a 70-pound dog, and uh, what we have now is a Canadian gray wolf. Of course, everything that's come that we've bought from the canadians that was such a good deal for them they're like you want to do what yeah <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah. well it's, it's like the lynx yeah you know the lynx is is protected here but you go you know 25 miles across the border and you can trap them there so they, lo- the same they love it we're raising lynx for them to trap over there on the other side but of then the go to alaska and you can trap them I it fought, doesn't make any sense i fought <laughs> uh fought wildfire all the way through college and uh, I was on this fire in the Walla Walla area in uh, southeast Washington. And every fire gets a, a reason for why we're trying to uh, contain it, why we're trying to put this fire out. And the reason we were fighting this fire, which had a lot of resources on it, was because we were protecting lynx habitat in a state that had no lynx at all. It is hilarious. But lynx have souls. And you go back to baiting, like you want to cancel bear baiting. Um, you know, you want to cancel baiting for coyotes or whatever. Like those are fuzzy, like Disney type characters. Nobody talks about canceling baiting for fish. Fish don't have souls. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. It's like um, you were talking about protecting things in Florida. They're protecting a bird that that nests down in the Everglades. And they're flooding the entire northern part of the Everglades and destroying the entire ecosystem. I mean, literally destroying it and killing all the deer and all the mammal life that's there to save the bird. And uh, <laughs> it just—it's been going on for years. For thirty years, it's been going on, and it, and it, the Everglades is dying because of it. You know, and and it doesn't make any sense. They, it's like they can't see the forest for the trees. So I have a good friend who works down there um, as a animal wildlife control specialist and animal damage control. And most of what he does is catching uh, pythons mm, yeah. out on the Everglades. And he caught the uh, the state record python this this summer, and it bit him, almost freaking killed him. It was 17 feet, 7 inches long. He's the one that caught that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we did a podcast together, um, Python Cowboy. If you guys want to look it up, I'll put a link in the in the description for this. But his... Um, his concept of the Florida panther, the mountain lion and the Everglades, was that there was way too many of them. And that was the primary cause of the loss of the key deer. Yes. It, it, it's, um, and that's something. So I grew up <clears throat> hunting out in the Everglades. And, and what's changed ever since I got out of it about 15 years ago, the big thing that's changed is the explosion of the cat and the pythons. Yep. And it's, it's really along with high water is, is changed, you know, the Everglades, uh, drastically. Totally. You know, it, yeah. it's, it's not even the same place that I used to go to out there and the cats. I follow some of these pages online, you know, these big cat pages where, you know, the people that love them down there and it's a matter of time till there's a, a really bad cat person conflict down there because, you know, it's, it's just growing, you know, it's, it's the, the Panthers are right in, suburbia down there and uh they're not small they're big i mean sure um and they don't have to be like if your nine pound house cat like decides that today is the day it's going to take you on (laughs) you're going to get hurt right yeah so you had you know a magnitude of 10 to that and you're in real trouble and uh, and that's the smallest end of a we don't get to uh trap bobcats you guys still have bobcats up here right for trapping you're allowed to trap bobcats? Yeah, but we don't have a lot of them in this area anymore because I think the lynx has kind of outcompeted them. They're they're uh, 
they're so, still they're actually becoming more prominent in New Hampshire again, and we started seeing more and more. And they actually tried to put a bill in to trap them, um, and I think it got shot down immediately, or it went through and got shot down after everybody realized what it was. It was one or the other, but. I, I having released a couple of bobcats and traps before I don't think a, a cat needs to be very big to hurt you because I'll tell you what they are not a fun animal to release <laughs> pole or not they are not a fun animal to yeah, release I told you about the plywood technique right yeah I think, I think I'm going to try that next yeah. time because it's it's a little unnerving trying to release one of those things and it, like I said I, we, we've been seeing bobcats in the area where I'm like, I'm down by one of Asaki and that area growing up, I never saw Bobcat. They were always very protected for that reason. And it seems like lately they're just, they're, they're growing in population very, very quickly, but there hasn't really been anything to address that they tried, like I said, but there's no hunting season. There's no trapping season. They're still protected. And then you cross over the border over here and you guys are actually able to hunt them, but now you're facing another species of them. So it's, it's crazy. Yep. Yeah. There's a lot more in southern central maine there's plenty of bobcats the guys seem to think they're increasing but not in the north you you ride up in this north country now for bobcat tracks and you'll all you'll see is lynx yeah rick rick shot a 45 pounder down there in my place in skowhegan it only had three legs jeez yeah 45 pounds with three legs that was a big fat son of a gun (laughs) but he i think he he killed one close to 45 or 50 right up here between here and Jackman. Yeah, I think back. it was 45 right over here. And then uh, Paul Laney got one up here that was 49. But that's been... Those are big cats. Yeah, that's 10 years ago, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. been a while. I don't hardly ever see bobcat tracks. You said you saw one, though, huh? You know, it might have been a lynx. I, I, I've never seen a lynx track before. It just looked like a bobcat track to me. <laughs> so, I well, don't know. Be, a lynx track would be quite a bit bigger it was a good sized track but it just wasn't in my mind at all that it was even a possibility yeah yeah i bet that's what you saw yeah, yeah. the northern part of new hampshire and maine it's pretty much a lynx hmm. that's cool well hal i read your book you did yeah i did i liked it Which i learned one? some stuff from it the big wood the the one that looks like the shirt that i'm wearing <laughs> <laughs> red and black check yeah um so I think that there there's a lot that Western hunters can learn from from the way you're tracking. Would you be willing to take a couple minutes to just talk through the the 101 of of tracking a deer? Find a good track. What's a good track look like? Well, you know what I've learned over the years is I've hunted a lot of places from here to Ontario and Montana and Adirondacks and in the tracks a, a good track is different in different areas. So Here in northern Maine, northern New Hampshire, we have a northern borealis whitetail. So it's a different subspecies than everywhere else. It's a spruce fir forest whitetail. For some reason, they have the biggest feet, and and, uh, supposedly they were the biggest bodied ones. Now, I know out in the farm country there now in Alberta and Saskatchewan, they get them big bodied ones too and stuff, but... uh, their, their feet are much bigger than any of the other ones. So here I look for a track that's, you know, like I call them three by threes, but they're not really square like that. They're, I like to see one three inches wide, three and a half long, you know. The real big ones are a little over three wide, four long, you know, just the the hoofs, you know. And then you get the big dew claws behind it and it could be six or seven inches long where you see the dew claws. That's the ones that get you excited. And it, it is a wild thing to me. It is a wild thing to me that you guys drag these deer out whole. <laughs> that I was explaining a, this to him. Bonkers. Yeah. Yeah. That is oh. ab- So we have, I don't know if you guys have, um, we call them knives. And it's, <laughs> it's sharp <laughs> on one side. And you can take something heavy like, the biggest deer in the world and you can cut them down make them smaller make it easier why do you do that that is crazy you can joke all you want you need to talk to the fishing game commission you're barking up the wrong trees <laughs> we don't have any say in how we have to handle our deer but yeah. actually we can cut them up here you can cut yeah, them up you here can, you can pack them out but then you can't weigh them then you can't weigh them see because oh, in see. maine they got the biggest bucks in maine club if you if you kill one that's uh field dresses over 200 not 199 and a half 
That's right. It's got to be 200. We're not rounding up. Yeah. Yeah. So you could kill one that weighs 200 the first week. He might only weigh 185 the last week. That's why you guys are hanging them by their head. You don't want any of that blood leaking out on the ground. That's right. (laughs) And that's also why you don't cut the nutsack off. Uh Uh-huh. That's good for a pound. (laughs) Maybe two on on the buck. Yeah. (laughs) Depends on the buck. Oh, Lord. (laughs) Slippery slope. Uh, So Uh, that's, it's, I guess, I think part of that is, is because when you're way, you kill a buck and you're a mile or two back in the woods, you ain't coming out for a pack frame. The buck's coming with you when you come out. No, sir. And you ain't going to come back in. You don't want to come back in again. You've been staying pretty close to the road this week, huh? I'm I'm saying I'm absolutely 100% coming out for a pack frame. You are? Okay. Really? Yes. Yes. You got, there's four of you here. <laughs> yeah. You got well, friends I, here for a reason. I, I've actually been, so I've been dragging bucks my whole life. I, I lived in New Hampshire and when I went out West, it was a, it was a, like a, a cultural difference to me. The first elk I shot, I was like, okay, I'm quartering this thing out here <laughs> and I'm, I'm bringing everything back with me. And, uh, it, it, it is different, but I think there's the, the, the part that gets missed a lot that I see out here is that there is something rewarding about dragging a buck out in New England, just because where, where you guys are out West, one of the things that I realized is so many people are given opportunities here to shoot a mule deer or a whitetail where out here in New England, we just don't have the opportunities frequently. Like some people to them, it is just that is like your chance that you just got a deer that you may never see again for the rest of your life. It, it's it's a pride thing, but it's also something that part of the experience out here, I think, is dragging that deer out. And I've gone through some some hellish drags, and they don't feel like a hellish drag at the time if it's a good buck and you worked hard for it. And you, it, it, it's it's more or less rewarding. You forget about that part of the experience. It's just it's a it's a lot of work, but it's it's one of those things that you will you, you don't you it's part of the entire overall package of shooting a New England deer. Bonkers. You explain that very well. I agree with you a hundred percent. And it, it's yeah. like you almost look forward to the pain because that's you know it's kind of like when moose hunting has changed a lot over the last ten years. I would say where there's a lot more people that are cutting moose up and packing them out now, where it used to never be done. It, it would. You know, you just wouldn't kill one far back. You'd Everyone killed them close to the roads. There was more moose. That's the way everyone hunted. Now it's changed where people are getting off the roads and everyone's cutting them up more and, and kind of doing it that way. And and uh, and now it's to the point where we look forward to cutting them up. It's like, all right, we kill a big, you know, a big bull back where it's got to be packed out. It's like, all right, you know, who cares? Let's cut it up and pack it out of here. Back when I was younger, I used to drag them out myself, but. Now I call for help. Actually, this year I drug mine. It was only about a third of a mile, so I got it. wasn't real heavy either, 185, so it went pretty good. When I, when I was a kid, I'd see these pictures of, of you guys, right, um, in, in catalogs or magazines or whatever, you know, dragging a, a full-bodied buck. I thought, these road hunting sons of guns, you know, they must just be shooting stuff 100 yards away or from a road or whatever, but... You know, it, it's it's not the case. You're you're going, and it's not. This isn't a clean couple of miles either. Um, it's tough. It's really difficult what you're doing. Um, I I think that you're crazy people. <laughs> so, so you you found you found a track that's 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 bigger than my future. Oh yeah, we it, got off track. Didn't yeah, we? yeah, we got off track on tracking. Yeah, and and uh, now what? You've decided that this is the one. Usually, when you pick one up in the morning. It's made in the night, obviously, right? Maybe it's made an hour ago. Maybe it's made eight hours ago. There's some ways you can tell, you know, depending on the temperature and stuff, you can get an educated guess. But usually it's going to be somewhat older, you know, within, you know, it's usually a few hours or half the night. And I just go right along on it quickly because, like I said, that buck might be five miles away, so you poke along on it you're never going to catch up to it so i just go and read the track because when you read the track you live in the deer's life and that's it you go along until you find out figure out what he's doing and i call it getting his mindset whether he's checking does or early season he's probably just 
wandering a little bit and then he's going to feed and lay down and so you know you just have to figure that out and when you think he's laying down you got to slow down and try to get a look at him for he be sneaky what makes you think he's going to lay down he uh generally they're going to feed around quite a bit you know they'll wander and feed and then usually they'll go uphill up either on a bluff up a ridge or something with a vantage point of their back track that's almost always if it isn't it's this time of year when they get real tired sometimes they get they get lazy and they don't they don't take the time to do that and they kind of just lay right along on the track on level ground or something and they make mistakes a lot you know this muzzle load a week but typically they're staring down the back track for something following them so you either got to they're up on a bluff you know sneak up there or if, the, if it's right sometimes you can the woods are right you can circle around to see if he's you know maybe still there you know if you can cut a circle all the way around and it didn't come out you know he's there then and then you can hunt it differently but usually you're not going to kill them laying in their bed i mean you can i've done it quite a few times but usually you're going to get them up and going and if you don't get a whack at him when he jumps up if you see him then it's the next maybe the next time is as i always call it the best time is the is the second chance when these bucks here mainly they'll they run off a little ways it might only be 100 yards it might be 500 but whatever it is they usually wait and see if something's coming after them you know i mean they they've just grown up being chased by coyotes and that's a natural predator and if, if a coyote's coming it's going to come quick on them so they wait and if nothing comes i i wait a half an hour when i when I jump a buck and he goes, I just sit down and I wait a half an hour because he, he'll go off and he'll wait and you'll see it written in the snow, his, his tracks where he's standing there kind of pacing, looking back. Then when he figures the coast is clear, he goes about his business. He might lay back down. He might decide to stay up and just go off and check does again or whatever he's going to do. But now he's on his feet, so it's easier to kill him when he's on his feet walking than it is laying down staring at his back track right so then you got to be sneaky and read the track what he's doing again and pay attention peek over the knolls and the cards line up you catch up to him in the right place and get him. if not you'd be chasing him all day once he knows you're after him and that, that's when the chase is on and you got to get creative one of the reasons I thought that this would be such a cool podcast is I grew up reading your books too Hal and I've tracked in this country since I was a kid in New Hampshire and Maine. And after going out West with James, his comment to me the first time we went elk hunting is why do you walk so much and you never stop in glass? And (laughs) I was like, I I don't know what you're talking about this glassing stuff. You just keep going until you catch up. And it was kind of a, a, a culture shock for me to realize that when you go to different parts of the country, the hunting is just not the same. I mean, we don't have the areas out here to look and scout for bucks from hillside to hillside. You're just, you're, you're, you're tracking them down until you catch up to them. And when I went out West, it was really interesting. The first time I hunted with you, like this guy is, James is a wizard with like, we'll go out on the hillside and I'll be sitting there like, all right, we're going to go up this mountain and this. And they'll go, hey, there's elk up there and there's elk over there. And I, <laughs> I, I literally like, even with the intent of him telling me where they are through the binoculars, I still can't see what he's talking about Yeah, because he's so accustomed to that. Right. And you get out here and it's that that's, that's how we live. That's how we hunt. And it's, it's pretty interesting because when you start going to different parts of the country and you start learning how people hunt differently, just because of their, their environment, it, it we have to be, we have to be the way we are out here in order to be able to be successful where the same thing is true with you guys out there and you learn how to cut miles back by making sure that you go up a place that's worthy we're out here it's just we're going to find a track and we're just going to keep going until that happens like you said you go five miles just to catch one deer and you have to know everything you're looking at is correct or you just chase a deer for five miles that you wish you hadn't chased all day long yeah it's quite common to chase one you know not chase but i've tracked many of them all day long 10 miles or more 12 miles whatever 
and you never catch up to them. You spent the whole day trying to get caught up and you don't just don't if they don't stop you're not going to catch up because you can't walk you can't run as fast as one can walk so that's a reality but you keep doing it day after day and eventually you get the right track on the right day and the right weather and guards line up but one thing I, i've hunted out out west quite a bit too whether for deer and elk and but i and and even before that just turkey hunting we started turkey hunting here i don't know 20 years ago or something but i figured out something by hunting other things it was a lot easier for me to hunt other animals because i could hunt these deer up here not bragging about that but i'm but you've seen the country now you see what we do once you can track or even hunt and kill deer here everything beyond that seems easy to us I'm not saying everything's easier, but it's easier for us because it's, I think it's the fundamentals, you know what I mean, of, of paying attention to the woods and, you know, being alert, you know. And I, when I first went elk hunting, I couldn't spot them elk either, you know. Yeah, there's three over there, and I'm looking, I'm like, where the hell are they up there, you know. But I, I learned you look for the color, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You look for the color, and then once you say, oh, well, that's how you do it, then it's okay. But yeah. the strategy of, for me, the strategy of trying to trying to kill that elk you can see is really quite simple to me, you know. Yeah, no, it, it, it certainly uh, it certainly can be. And the, the things that complicate it with elk is that, you know, they can smell you from over a mile. Right. Um, and what the wind's doing here is, ain't what the wind's doing over right. there. So, and then they're a very different animal at different times of year. And, you know, when we're hunting, hunting elk, it's a, it's a calling show if it's in the rut at all. And if, uh, if you're into rifle season, it's a totally different deal. And you're going to deal with temperatures that, you know, may start out at a hundred degrees in early season and be 20 or 30 below at the end of the season. So the animals behavior and then the hunting terrain and, and uh, and the weather is just going to change a lot throughout the year. Sure, but I would ag- agree that that fundamentally this is a very very strong base to become any other type of hunter. And if folks are wanting to improve themselves as hunters, this is a must for them to come out and do. Because if they even if they don't come out here and ever see a deer, just like I'm more than likely not going to see a deer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning a lot. You know, uh, yeah. Tim and I cut a cut a track that was 24 hours old, and uh, there wasn't a lot of hope in me running that thing down and getting a look at it. But I followed it until I couldn't anymore because I just wanted to learn from it. I right. have no idea what a deer does in these <laughs> woods, um, but you know, if I get to follow it for half a mile, learn an awful lot about it. If I get to follow it for a mile, I learn whole lot more and then i can start thinking about okay well this is what the, that deer did and this is that similar terrain over here so maybe i'll go look and see if i can find a track there but you can really be a student of this stuff and then take all those skills and go someplace else and be more successful than you previously were so i would highly encourage people to come out to your neck of the woods and, and check this stuff out it's an adventure i i wondered when you guys were coming in i'd look at the weather and everything and wasn't sure what your expectations were or what your experience was with this type of hunting and everything. And I thought, oof, this is going to be a rough week. But I'm I'm glad, number one, that you had a little bit of something to, even though it was more like a dusting, a heavy dusting, but you had a little something to go with and, and you know, you made the most of it because that's all you can do. Oh, yeah. I, I've never muzzle loader hunted before. I mean, that that's a crazy thing to me that you would even try and use a muzzle loader in, in the 21st century to shoot at something. But uh, <laughs> that, that's that's the rules that, that we got to play by. So I'm, uh-huh. I'm all about packing that thing around. So my expectation was that I wasn't going to see a deer. And then if I did, that the gun wasn't going to go off. Um, so, so far. <laughs> you got that new Sig Sauer muzzle loader, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, but yeah, so far I've, I've been correct. So I haven't seen a deer and my muzzle loader hasn't gone off. <laughs> we, it's, it's interesting because prior to working for Sig, I worked for a muzzle loader company. And where James says he's never shot a muzzle loader, it wasn't really surprising to me because one of the things about out here about not having a lot of deer, we still have a muzzle loader season. It's an opportunity season. And uh, prior, I worked for the the old Thompson Center, 
And back then, when all these muzzleloader companies existed, it was because there was there was opportunity seasons. Otherwise, there's no reason to do it. And the only places that they still exist that I've seen are in areas that don't have high densities of deer because there's still a reason to do it. We, we were facing, as a company back then, where states all around the country were like, hey, we have a muzzleloader season. Then it was like, okay, we have too many deer. Now it's a single shot season. All right, there's still too many deer. Now it's a bolt action season. It, and it would just eventually become, they just had a really long rifle season. And muzzleloading in the Northeast is very different in the sense that because the density of deer is not as heavy, muzzleloader has always been either an early jump or a late last opportunity in the New England states because it's one of those things that we don't we don't have as much deer that we can throw something like that in there and have it be uh, something that people can look at and say like wow that's that gives me a second opportunity or in my case in New Hampshire an early opportunity at the season and also we have a lot of shotgun only cities and states in New Hampshire and southern Maine that you can buy a muzzleloader and you can hunt the entire season and it allows you not to have to have a shotgun and in some of those areas so it's it was it was kind of interesting because i see it now happening across the country with crossbows um at the time when i was there night rifles started off really big with pushing the muzzleloader seasons and then it progressed into all of these different states taking it on as an opportunity and then when when it obviously started to get to the point where deer densities weren't being controlled in some of the the states that had muzzleloader seasons it fell off and now the crossbow guys are using the same type of strategy of, hey, uh, uh, an archer's never going to buy a crossbow. This is a rifle hunter that can help you take out more deer. And so the states that have high densities of deer are now opening up crossbow seasons the same way muzzleloader seasons were popular at one point. Mm-hmm. And I'm not trying to bag on muzzleloaders here. Um, I think that they're a very good tool for this this type of this type of hunting. Because the reality is, I'm sure you get some patient deer that um stand there after somebody misses but for the most part they don't got to go very far before you can't see them anymore (laughs) well and these guys over here have it like i said it's much different over here when you're doing a late opportunity muzzleloader now you have two disadvantages you have deer that have been educated you have deer that are out of the rut they're tired and now you're throwing in a single shot muzzleloader that you hope you make one good shot when you have that opportunity in new hampshire for us it's we start right around halloween every year so we have that like they're coming into the pre-rut there's deer moving all over the place it's actually one of the best opportunity seasons so states in new england look at it differently in like the sense it's like a, a hail mary or it's the beginning of the game where you could look at it either way. Yeah, and and the point that I'm making is that it's a fine tool for the job here because you're probably only getting it one shot. It's not that far, and a big heavy bullet that's not going that fast is a good exactly. tool. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it's fine. I I saw a discussion the other day. It was a thread online about you know someone just brought up the idea of you know the muzzleloader season first and run the light rifle season longer and all that, which will never happen, but. <clears throat> I like it the way it's set up just for the reasons that you said. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, for, for us in this area, the way the deer, the way it normally is, we usually have good snow during muzzleloader. Um, it's, uh, I think it just works out well as opposed to having it first. Uh, you know, no one would, I think the state makes more money because they're, they're banking on the fact that no one's going to kill a deer with a gun. And now they're going to go spend that $13 license. and, and, you know, then muzzleloader hunting it. And it works well that way. Most states are a last season Hail Mary. It, yeah. It's one of those things where it's either a last season Hail Mary or some of the states like, you know, out in Ohio, they have a like almost a mid-January season that's like all the deer are herding up, eating in the fields, and they need to take a few more deer out before the season ends, and they use it for that. But it, it's, it is one of those things that like it, it, it is better, I agree, on the back end of it because we unfortunately, we, we have a three-week rifle season, but we have muzzle order before that, and it it changes the deer's behavior just because there's people in the woods. Right. Yep. Did, uh, well, you haven't seen it yet, but but I had shot one with a muzzle loader last year, and that film's going to be released. When, Joe? Any day now? I have no idea. We'll get you the, <laughs> well, it'll be. You it'll say be, that like it's my decision. <laughs> it'll, be on, it'll be on our Big Woods Box webpage anyways in the Facebook page, but it's pretty Andy cool. shot in his bed. Which was that was shot, that was a pretty cool part. I shot of it. him laying in his bed on two tracked him two days, shot him three times, and then shot him in his bed. And that's gonna be on that's in on film. Be about a th- I think it comes out around thirty minutes. It's gonna be a nice film. It's an educational film. It's not gonna be a dramatic 
cinematic thing, even though Joe wants it to be. But it's going to be a teaching thing, you know. He, it's he put so many Z. words in my mouth. <laughs> I think that's kind of interesting too, James. That was different to me about the West out here. Is um, in the West, you're hunting with a long range rifle, and your game is one shot. Your game is I'm going to get one opportunity at this animal. Animal, I'm going to shoot it 500 yards, and I'm going to hope that I make a good shot. I may get a follow up shot, but I'm going to try to knock this animal down with one shot. We're out here, as you've seen in these woods, being as tight as they are. Like Hal was just saying you're a lot of times you're you're four to five shots at an animal before you're taking it down just because of the reality of tracking it's very very different it's not really that many if i got my pump gun <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, the 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 bigger uh pump gun calibers do have a tendency to put them down quicker well you know the other thing with the muzzle loader is is they do not shoot through the brush good yep it doesn't take much to deflect them up. i don't know why it is but just a slower yeah. moving bigger bullet but well, I don't know how many times I've tried to shoot through, you know, just some whippets and stuff, and it, it just doesn't get there. With the old lot six or the 180 grain core locks get there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So I understand you were going to make a big announcement for SIG that they're coming out with a new pump carbine. Was that? Yeah, it'll be out next week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm if, glad we could be the first to debut it and talk about it. If, yeah. if I have my way, I, I honestly think that would be in the agenda. Um, but, I mean, as a company, we're we're definitely – it's kind of cool in the last two years we've started to progress into the hunting market as heavily as we are. When I started there, like I said, I had come from Thompson Center, and it was, uh, it was kind of a, a bittersweet separation when – Thompson Center left New Hampshire and like we we were all like a big family there and it was it was sad to see it go and uh I ended up down at SIG and at the time SIG was obviously we're a very military handgun oriented company and we had ammunition um and we had optics um and we were really still just never really dove into the hunting market and then in the last uh two or three years we've become very quickly overnight a hunting company and it's growing immensely for us we started off by doing um optics we have a a, an optic system called the bdx which is a uh it's bluetooth technology that reads from the rangefinder to the scope so when you range find an animal out at 400 yards it will actually adjust the scope automatically based on the data that's in your phone that you're plugging into this thing so you can make a shot. Oh, I, Hal's going to be standing in line for yeah. that one. I, I can't know. wait to get can, me one of them. They, they, they're, they're incredible. We've had some opportunities out west that have just been amazing. Where like we went out this year, me and James went out and did a a, a, a mountain goat hunt up in Alaska, and it, it's just incredible. The, the gentleman I was with uh, ranged the mountain goat at 328 yards, and you just watch the dot inside just adjust right to where it goes hold on and shoot. It's incredible. And we did that. And that was kind of our bound into the the hunting market. And then we launched a couple of different uh, hunting ammunitions last year. And then this prior year, we uh, this year, and we launched uh, a bolt action rifle that's a hunting rifle for the first time. So this is like our full entrenchment into the hunting industry. And it's been really cool because one of the things about that you didn't know at the time in in our corporate headquarters was how many people surfaced as hunters when they all started seeing all these products come out. And it was pretty cool. We had a lot of people there that are avid New England hunters that have done this their whole life. And we had a lot of people from in the industry, like Tim, who's up here with us, who has been a hunter his whole life and worked for hunting firearms manufacturers. And it's exciting for all of us because you know we've all been down that road and we couldn't have picked a better year because with all this stuff going on uh i think in the past it's always been the int- the interesting thing to everybody in times like this is the uh you know 223 9 millimeter ar's handguns uh, this is the first time i've seen a surge in the hunting market as much as we've seen in this year because of everything that's going on which is fantastic it was good timing for us but it's just mm. good for the industry to see how many people are getting into it absolutely yeah. and so you you started talking a little bit and um about the ammunition side and uh could you talk a little bit about we all know there's a major shortage and that production's <laughs> been uh, give us your side of it as far as what it's like and 
and uh, what it's like trying to keep up. Yeah, what I just, uh, what I was just saying is is part of the reason this one's been such a struggle. I think in the past it's always been you're fighting with two calibers. If you can make nine millimeter and five five six, that's what you're going to end up fighting with when there's any sort of surge like this. This one is not like that, and the reason being is we're talking to people all around the country that are saying hunting rifles are surging and everything is surging. So the ammunition companies aren't having the same situation that they've had in the past where it was just, you know, try to make two ammunitions as fast as you can. They're making 30 out six as fast as they're trying to make everything else because people are looking to try to get a little bit of everything right now. So from an ammunition manufacturer, it, it's tough because there's two things. One, we've we've learned in the past that um, ammunition is one of those things that we know that there are spikes that go up and down. Now, granted, in the last 10 years, ammunition as a whole has increased significantly in sales. But if you decide to go, you know, ramp up to the point where you're just, you know, trying to catch up with this demand, you're going to be disappointed when it goes back down. So all the manufacturing companies for ammunition have gotten pretty smart to make as much as you can and try to be as good as you can on forecasting what the market is looking for. Try to get hunting ammunition into the market in the fall. Try to provide everything else that everybody's looking for. But it's one of those things that you just, you, you're chasing your tail and y- you know you are, but you're going to try to keep up the best you can and try to see how much you can put out there during this time frame. But yeah, none of us are in a position right now where we're having a hard time selling anything. It, it's just a matter of shipping at this point. Yeah, we we talked a little bit about the the seventy six hundred and seven sixties earlier. How the popularity of that gun is just off the charts right now. Um, which if I knew what I knew a year ago. If I knew that, I'd have, been, <laughs> I'd have bought a lot more of them. <clears throat> it's crazy. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I've never seen like we were saying. That, you know, I went for thirty six hundred. I think on yeah. Gun Broker, one of the Big Woods Bucks one. But it's not just limited edition guy. it's any 760 or 7600 people are just clamoring for them let, and uh let me ask you this uh are you allowed to hunt with semi-automatics here yeah. yes oh yeah so why in the flat earth would you still want to use a pump carries better it's lighter much lighter the in carry the, is the biggest in part the, in the weather you have operational problems with it all right you get certain days the temperature is like uh some days it's just right where you, just the heat of your hand and body carrying your gun. The snow melts when it falls on it and it runs down inside, but then it freezes. And if it does that in, in the automatics, you know, it gets down in the spring actions and stuff, can freeze up. It, even the pumps can. But I always, when it, if it's those kind of days or you, like you go under the, you ever get under these fir trees this week? Oh, yeah. Go through some fir trees, right? Yeah. Well, when they got snow hanging in them, two or three inches of it, and you go under them, that all falls on you. You got to turn your gun up. I tap it right out of my slide because if you let that in there and then it melts and it freezes, it's all ice in there. You can't cycle it. So, what's your rifle weigh? Six pounds, I think they weigh six, six and a half, 7,600 carbine. And then you put a scope on it? Nope. Iron sights? Peep. Peep sight. Big peep, big aperture. I take yeah. I, it's a Williams peep I use, and I take the aperture out and throw it away and shoot through the threaded hole. And and there is I I carry it. I have a Browning long track that I hunt with sometimes. I cut it down, and uh, there's a big difference between the way that carries in a seventy six hundred. A seventy six hundred is a uh, carries just so nicely, and then. The Woodman Arms muzzleloader was modeled right. right after that and carries just the same. And so that's why that's become so popular up here. And that weighs five and a half. What did you carry in the Marine Corps? My M16. Yeah. So, so would you ever think about carrying a, a 308 that was like that? I have one. I have an R25. No, too heavy. What if we got it lighter? I don't know. what. It won't carry right. That type of a pistol grip is not made for fast shooting you know it also like the grip hanging down it's going to catch on stuff and you know the old saying pry out of my cold dead hands that's hal in a 7600 okay uh, so i should, he will I, should never. Give, I should give up at this point <laughs> or maybe five minutes ago I, no hey, I, I don't i don't even use a different one i use the same one i started with in 1988 
and I've everybody said I I'll get I've got all kinds of them when I get a new one different cal but people go you're gonna kill a buck with that one I go nope I'm gonna use my regular one you know before I became a, a product manager it was kind of interesting I got to travel as I worked in more of a sales role at my company and I like I said I grew up hunting here and I always thought it was super interesting I would go to states like Pennsylvania and then I'd go out west and you realize that pretty much there is no one gun that or caliber at that that people will just flock around nationwide right like there's been surgeons in you know calibers like the 65 creed more and things like that in the last couple of years but at the end of the day it is 100% geographical like i would go into pennsylvania and i worked at a couple of places there and and they're a little bit similar to here you know a, a 7600 and a 35 wheel and pump was a huge thing down there um, but then I'd talk to people th- th- there and they'd be like, you know, why would anybody deer hunt with anything but a six millimeter? Y- you just don't hear right. about six millimeter in a lot of these areas. And same thing out West where a lot of guys are 300 wood mag, you come out here and you want a magnum action or you want a long action. It's, it's a 30 out six. It, it's, it was always crazy to me, but part of what it is, is exactly what Hal just explained is you become, it's it's what you're the way you're hunting crafts what your firearm becomes and different parts of the country everybody has their way of hunting that is the most successful manner and that was what i always found interesting about being a rifle manager was you can't just paint a broad brush you can't say i'm going to make one gun and everybody in the country is going to flock and buy this every single part of the country has a gun that makes more sense than other places in the country it's just it's it's 100% geographical, caliber-wise and rifle-wise. Yeah, like even here, everybody doesn't track. You know, trackers are still a minority. More of them are getting into it, more of them are trying it in the north because that's where southern Maine doesn't get the snow to track that much. But but you have to have the rifle that's suited to that game, right? And it's got to become, I call it, it just becomes a part of you. You know, it's... It's like an extension of your arm. You got to be able to shoot that, take the safety off, and shoot that in a split second sometimes. And that's why you, I always tell people just use the same gun. Don't don't bring two guns and try one today and one tomorrow. Doesn't work. Even even like in the past. I mean, I've always used my seventy six hundreds. Got the cross bolt safety, but until Woodman Arms made this muzzle loader, I had different ones. I tried different muzzle loaders. Back when, remember when Gornick had the... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had oh, one yeah. of those, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and then I had the uh, Omega. Loved it. But that hammer cost me several good bucks because I'm not used to pulling the hammer back in that extra second to get the hammer back because I'm not used to it. I have to think about it. Pull the hammer back and shoot. It's too late. So that's why people have to get used to their gun. And here it's... It is not just exclusively 7600s because there's a big contingency of guys that shoot 99 Savages, Winchester 94s. I mean, it's... Same premise, you know, too easy carry. Yeah, you know, and, and there is a lot of guys that use the semi-automatics. But whatever you decide to use, got to carry nice and be able to operate it so quickly. So what you just said is interesting, too, because all three guns that you've named are guns that are either hard to get in the market or are gone. And that was one of the things that I found interesting about when I became a product manager in the rifle side years and years ago was that uh, I I found out really quickly that nothing sells like a shortage and people get very, they get a gun. Uh, Guns aren't like archery equipment. People don't go and say, Hey, I'm going to buy a new gun every single year. You buy a gun and you keep it for 30 years. It stays in your safe. You hand it down in your family. So it's one of those things where people would be like, well, there's no market anymore for that gun. And it it wasn't true. It's just generationally, you were seeing people moving into new style of firearms because of what they were seeing on TV or what they were seeing in magazines. And so they, they changed the way that they are hunting. But as far as a, a demand perspective, like you just said, as soon as, you know, anybody says, Hey, this type of gun is going away. The market, like it's crazy to see, how quickly people just come out of the woodwork and say, oh my gosh, I never bought one and I should have. And we'd right. see, 
we, we'd see and they these, panic and try to find one. yeah then they're on yeah. then they're on gun broker spending four times what the gun cost because they they gotta have one and they screwed up and they never did it when they said they should and it, it, it's super interesting yeah. because it, the like i said it, there's no easy way to look at it like when when you were talking about the muzzleloader for for years i struggled with that idea of everybody in the country would want a 28 inch muzzleloader because we were selling a lot of them and I never understood a purpose for it because your velocity gain was next to nothing in a 28 inch muzzleloader. But in the Midwestern states, it was a 200 yard gun. Everybody called it a 200 yard gun when I would go out there. Out here, it was like, how short can we get this thing without right. me getting in trouble <laughs> so I can walk through the brush with it? Yeah. And it, it was, it's pretty interesting because when you work in a, country, a company in the Northeast, one of the reasons we have James is because. I can't understand how James hunts. I can make a gun that works perfectly for out here because this is where I grew up hunting my entire life. I know how to hunt out here. As soon as I go out and I hand him one of my guns, he looked at it and said, you need to do X, Y, and Z because this isn't going to work for me and here's why. And that's where we start bringing in ambassadors on our side because we, we, don't, we don't have an understanding of all the different markets. And when I, when I worked at Thompson Center years ago, it was like everybody would say, why would anybody want this? And it's because we all understand our products in the Northeast. But as you move around the country, it is, it's incredible how different everybody is. I could go into one state and make a caliber and I could sell every one I could possibly make. And then I bring it up here and everybody just stares at it. And no one wants to even look at it. And it's just, it's a lot of it, which is kind of neat is it's, it's hand down from generation to generation. Like when Hal talks to somebody, you're going to tell them a 30 out six is the perfect caliber, just like I would tell my friend that. But if I ask James, his perception that he's going to tell to his nephew or his son is going to be completely different as far as what you should use as the perfect caliber. So it, it there, there's, it's not six, five creed. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody at this table universally agrees with that. Like the, the, the six, five creed more has gotten very popular as a caliber for us. We, we do really well with it. But I do think it, it, it's another perfect example of a caliber that took off in certain areas of the country because it's a flat shooting caliber. And Oh, it's super fun. It doesn't recoil. You can shoot a long ways with it. It's awesome. It's, it's just, But it's a fad caliber. It is. <laughs> it is. It's going to be around for a long time. Yeah. Um, it's just that right now people can, can shoot a steel target at 800 yards with it really easily. And they, they don't do the math to realize that that bullet, while it's hitting the target... It doesn't have enough velocity to function. So, you know, being accurate is one thing. Having an, enough bullet to actually do some good once you get out there is a whole nother thing. Right. Do you think that the uh, the seventy six hundred it really it was really brought to to light by Larry Benoit's first book? You know, that was really the first. Um, well, when it, people started. It may have been up here, but it wasn't because Pennsylvania used those for a long time because yeah. they, they, they weren't allowed to use semi-automatic, so okay. they all bought. They're was, very popular in Pennsylvania, and 35 okay. Wheeling was very popular in yeah. Pennsylvania in the 7600 for a long time. It was it was popular in Pennsylvania before it was. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. Yep. From way back, back when they back when they were 760s. And, you know, you got to remember, there's, what, a million hunters in Pennsylvania? Probably half of them had a. 760 that was the gun so that was where it really got yep. going and then then people started using them here i mean i'm sure they always did I, I mean people they'll read a book and they'll see well that guy's successful and that's what he's using so i gotta you know it's a it's the age old yeah there's probably some there's some truth to that because people that are successful with a certain gun that they use and they get good with it other people could too, you know. It's going to be good for someone else, no matter what it is, you know. So it's might call that tried and true or whatever, but sure. I think social media has had a major impact too, as crazy as this sounds. YouTube especially has had an impact in the last 10 years on what people are using for firearms because years and years ago, everything was driven by TV. And the problem with TV always was that 90% of TV is filmed in one part of the country. So people would watch whitetail hunters that are shooting with a scope, with a high-powered rifle in a specific area of the country where they're sitting in a tree stand and that's the application. So you live out here and you turn on TV and you go, that's what I need. And so that was where a lot of the fall off of an open site 
rifle and trackers happened from was just people's understanding of, hey, I'm getting into whitetail hunting. Oh, that's how you're supposed to do it. That's what I'll get. And now that the surgence of, you know, like social media, like YouTube and people being able to put up videos and show people other ways of hunting, people are exploring to see how you hunt in your specific area. You're no longer just, hey, how do you hunt? Oh, it's like that? No. If you've been out to Ohio, you know <laughs> this is not Ohio. And you learn pretty quickly when you start walking through the woods. It, it's funny you say that. I, I found a channel that I've dog hunted some down in South Georgia. Uh, where it's, it's just a way of life down there, you know, dog hunting for deer. And, uh, so there's this channel that popped up on my feed and I started checking it out. And it's a guy that runs a bunch of hounds dog hunting. And it is unbelievable how many followers they have. And it's the same, you know, they're running around and pick up trucks with radios and the whole nine yards. <laughs> and that's all it is. And, uh, it's just super, it's a regional thing, super regional. I mean, when you talk about hound hunting for deer, but it's, uh, it certainly isn't everyone from down in the South that's watching it. It's people from all over saying, Oh, they can do that there. And, and that's kind of cool, you know? And yep. so they get a following, but it's exactly to the point that you made, you know, regional hunting's different and YouTube is what's well. And I think YouTube, there. YouTube and uh, media like that has created more people use it more for education where they were using TV for entertainment. When I want to learn how to hunt in the Northeast and I can go on YouTube and say, you know, northeast hunting and you know big wood bucks pops up and i can watch those videos and say oh this is interesting this is how i'm supposed to hunt when i learn how to hunt as compared to in the past where you you know you turn on the tv and you thought that was it but i i think tv has always been used more as an entertainment side of it where people turn it on as just to watch tv but youtube is one of those things where when i want to go hunt in the west where james is i'm going to google Hey, how do I hunt in Oregon? And I'm going to see elk videos that tell me a way to hunt in that area of the country. You never had that in the past. It's really, it's kind of, you now have a, an, a, the ability to look anywhere in the world where you're going to go hunt and learn how those people hunt rather than just turning on a television show, thinking that that's the, the broad brush that paints everything. And that's how it's done everywhere in the world. And we're all learning from each other and, and getting better. And uh, that just goes back to what I was talking about earlier with me coming up here, like I've definitely got lessons that are reinforced after reading your book that, uh, that I'm going to be able to take home and then apply, especially to, to late season elk. And I've, I've tracked a lot of elk down before. Um, but I was doing it in the most basic way that I could, which was just to follow it and then pick my face up every once in a while and, uh, hope that, you know, there either was or was not an elk right in front of me. There's so much more to it than that. I learned a lot about uh, tracking when I was in the Marine Corps um, because we were looking really closely at how IEDs were getting put in the ground, and that was that was definitely tracking 101. And then when I was in Africa, I learned a lot about tracking on dry ground and you know applying lessons that I'd learned from hunting lions as a kid and and uh, hunt, hunting elk in college and stuff like that. And then you keep going and keep pushing that into new areas and learning new techniques from new people. I mean, you, you just have to try to improve. And, and while YouTube is a great way to do that, um, it's just the baseline to start asking the questions and then to get the answers, you got to come out and actually do it. And, uh, I think this is a good place for it. So, yeah. so where does the, the uh, name six ranch come from? Uh, it's the name of my family ranch. Okay. Um, so it's a it's a ranch that has been in my family since 1884, which is a long time in the West. And uh, I think it was the sixth brand that was registered in the state. We we're not quite sure, but the the number six is our brand. And uh, there are no there are no single digit brands basically anywhere in the West. So pretty cool. Those all got all got washed out, but ours is still there. It's one of the oldest businesses in the state. Nice, nice, yeah. Well, I'm going to definitely check out your podcast and, and listen in. What what do yours uh, usually run for time? How long do you usually go? 45 to an hour. All right. Well, we got an extra special long one today. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's been a lot. I've enjoyed it, guys. Just glad you guys uh, yeah. came and checked out our area and, and uh, agreed to come and Thank you very much. chew the fat with us. And Thank you for your hospitality. 
Yeah, maybe he'll come back to Maine again when we get some snow, huh? He doesn't. He doesn't have an option. <laughs> oh, he, he, he's he's coming back here with me. He's he's uh, the whole reason this whole thing started was just because I thought uh, after knowing James now for a couple of years and hunting with him, it was the you need to come out and see how we do it. And I think me and Tim were very excited to bring him out here to show him this, just because James is an incredibly knowledgeable hunter, like beyond my wildest dreams. And I've like I said, I read your books my whole life. And it was like, wow, what a cool opportunity to take a guy who's the master of the West and bring him out to see the master of the East yeah. and see how the worlds are different. It's it's just crazy. And then James has to figure out a way to take you out there to go elk hunting eventually or lion hunting. Yeah, we should do lion hunt. That'd be fun. Yeah. Don't, before, I, before I get too old. Huh? Don't bring your pump. I'll, I'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I, so one last funny thing. I was... I'd shot a few elk out there in Colorado, and I'm like, it's just like picking them off, you know what I mean? It wasn't a big deal, so I said, I'm, next year I'm going to take my pump gun with me. <laughs> so I, I shot one in the in the oak brush with my pump at 80 yards, snuck in there, and I could hear him rattling you, around with You know cows. all those guys out west, just from my minimal time going out there, were like, what in flat earth is that man carrying around in the woods out here? Because yeah. they've probably never seen a pump rifle. No, in the the rest of the guys laughed at Did me. They? they said, yep. that's what you use? And I go, yeah. <laughs> they weren't laughing when we, we all, that's the one that's in the wall that's with the heaviest rack in there on this yeah. side. You now, know? there's a bunch of guys listening to this that had to Google what a 7600 is. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. 7,600 from a peep site. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure, you guys. Thank you. Yeah, we've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Well, until next time, good luck on the trail. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the show. This episode was edited by Emily Brannigan with original music written and performed by Justin Hay. Artwork for the Six Ranch podcast was created by John Chatterlin and digitized by Celia Christofferson. If you enjoyed the show, I encourage you to share it with a friend and subscribe. You can find photos and more content on Instagram at Six Ranch Podcast. I'll catch you next week. <laughs>